based classifiers, starting with classification and regression trees. And then moving on to random forest. Uh, this orthogonal is, uh, this development is somewhat orthogonal to uh, everything that we've been discussing in terms of neural networks and support vector machines and so on. Um, but they're very successful in practice, and that's why we're discussing uh, discussing them. So, uh, such trees, they use a series of simple questions to classify each sample. If we admit for every question just a yes or no answer, then we would obtain a binary tree. It means more wiping for me. <laughs> so uh, admitting yes or no answers gives well, this is bigger. <laughs> Gives a binary tree. So, for the sake of argument, consider a 2D feature space with some uh, funny distribution of where the two classes lie. say this would be the distribution of the two classes and well one possible tree would look as follows uh, if we now ad uh, admit axis orthogonal splits only we would have some uh, I'm going to number all the thresholds we would have a threshold t1 here so we could first ask the question is our sample x2 is it larger than the threshold T1, yes or no? And I could keep going with some threshold T2. Uh, so we, we could ask if X1 is smaller than T2. And if the answer is yes again, so I would uh, predict the red class. If the answer is no, I would predict the green class. And nah, we're sorry, we're not yet done. we still have uh, some overlap of the classes here so I could introduce a threshold t3 and ask if x1 is smaller than t3 and if the answer is yes I would predict the green class and if the answer is no I would predict the red class and of course, you can keep iterating this until, uh, especially when you have overlapping classes, uh, until you have pure leaves. Now, we've made a couple of design decisions here. In uh, 
particular in this example. So what are the limitations? That we have used here, we've used only axis orthogonal splits. And this is not a necessary limitation, so you can you can think of uh, using oblique splits. Um, and then secondly, the tree has been constructed recursively in some greedy fashion. And I've not really mentioned according to what criteria or what, what criterion I've, I've used here. Uh, also note that these uh, iterative splits, they only work on, so it's always conditional on the previous uh, decisions. So if I want to make the problem a little more complicated and say I have more green class here and more red class there. So these splits, they don't partition all of space like a perceptron does, but they only partition uh, half spaces. So they're so some of these leaves will correspond to open half spaces, so they are have infinite volume and other partitions uh, are really bounded on, on all sides. <coughs> and so essentially we partition feature space and you could think of uh, non-greedy partitionings, um, but to find the optimum tree, so for instance one that would separate your classes with the minimum number of nodes, uh, that it would be a hard optimization problem. This is why we resort to uh, iterative uh, or greedy construction of those trees. So the resulting tree is not necessarily of minimum size. Now, people use impurity criteria for this iterative construction. And there's a, there's a zoo of these. Uh, the, the aim is to always make the next split that will reduce your impurity most. Uh, so something that people, one criterion that people have been using <coughs> is the entropy. So the impurity at node capital N is the probability so j is now uh, the different classes that you can have the set of classes and that's just the entropy that you know so this would be the p of j would be the fraction of patterns in class J. There is also the misclassification impurity. It's 
there is something you can't reach? If you have wiping the board, <laughs> we have a deal. <laughs> okay. And there is the genie impurity. All these criteria are used for classification trees. For regression trees, you could, for instance, use uh, the sum of squared errors. So here, the impurity at a given node is, uh, that can be interpreted if you uh, if you pick one class randomly and assign another class as answer, this would be the expected error. And you can see that as follows. So, or it, it can be it can be rewritten in a, in a different way uh, because if you look at so all these uh, fractions must sum up to one so one times one one and you can rearrange so as to write the sum over all i and j and now omit the diagonal elements of wealth in a society. And here you see some, uh, 
Southern American countries, Brazil and Mexico, that scare poorly on this, and then, uh, for instance, Scandinavian countries, uh, or China, until a few years ago, where wealth was evenly distributed. Oh, just uh, a class. So I and ah, excuse me. <coughs> Thank you. Um, well, the okay, so this summation sign still refers to, uh, let, let me just delete the brackets. Yeah. So if you compare these uh, three criteria for the two class case, uh, we have um, the misclassification error, which uh, I will rescale them. Um, we have um, gene impurity, which is just a parabola. And we have uh, the entropy, which is a little flatter still. And as I said, uh, because we sum over uh, all i except j, this is the probability of uh, picking any class and then predicting a wrong class. Yeah? So just the, the error of a, uh, of a random prediction that you're going to get. So uh, it is desirable to have uh, pure leaves because in... Uh, so, so leaves that have as high a probability as possible for one of the classes, uh, because this will, you know, minimize the damage if you then uh, predict this dominant class. So we have a couple of impurity criteria, and these are then used in a greedy strategy. Namely to always choose the next node or split so as to maximize the gain in impurity. The drop, not the gain, sorry. We want the impurity to be as small as possible in, in the leaves. So the difference in impurity at a node n would be, that can be achieved by uh, creating a son and daughter would be the current impurity minus uh, PL is the fraction of samples that will go into the left child multiplied with the impurity of this left child minus the probability to go into the right child, which is one minus PL times the impurity associated with the right child.
So using this particular greedy strategy is really uh, an arbitrary decision and one that has been uh, guided by uh, maximizing uh, computational performance. In particular, when you use just a single feature uh, for a decision at a time. So the computational complexity of this greedy approach at the is at the root node So the root node is uh, the first decision. It's where our tree starts. If we use uh, such a, a monothetic splits, so if we just split orthogonal to the feature axis, we only need to sort the samples in order to find the best position. which is log linear in cost. But we need to do so according to each of our P features. So that overall we get at this stage P times N log N. And we then need to compute the impurity for each of our possible splits. And if we have n points, then we have n minus one possible splits between these points. in the p dimensions. So this would be order of p times n. So the overall complexity at the root node would then be, if we combine these two, order of p n log n. Now, in an ideal world, each of the child will receive half of the nodes of the sample, uh, but we have twice as many nodes at each additional layer. So if the tree was balanced, which in reality it is not, we would have at level one. So we have two nodes and in each node we have half as many samples as before. But since we have two nodes, this whole thing would be multiplied with two. So uh, sorry, dimensionality was P, not D. And at the level two, we would already have four nodes, not two. Dimensionality is still the same but we only have a quarter of the number of features. And so on. And in a balanced tree, we would have log n levels. Or 
LG in, the binary log. So total cost would be the number of levels times that. So it would be uh, Remember that this was only for a balance tree, so this is just a very rough estimate. So we have the following scheme. We, we start initially by sorting all our samples according to the one feature and according to the other feature. We uh, try out all of these p times uh, n minus 1 splits. We compute which of these splits gives us the greatest reduction in impurity. We make that split and uh, then we uh, in each of the children, we start the same procedure all over again. So, uh, so far so good. However, uh, these trees will look very different depending on what exactly your data set looks like. So if you change your training set minimally, or if you go from one training set to the next, the trees are going to look very different. So we need to discuss regularization. We could do no regularization at all and build, continue building each tree until it has pure leaves only. That is possible, but it's uh, very likely an overfitting. So just as in the one nearest neighbor classifier, uh, your tree is going to become very complicated in areas where the two classes overlap. Secondly, you could use an early stopping procedure. Where the idea is to only extend a tree by, addif by additional children if the drop in impurity is above some threshold. raising the problem of how you fix this threshold. You could also use early stopping when a subtree has too few leaps, too few uh, samples. Or you could stop b 
based on cross-validation error. Or you could stop when a uh, compound criterion, namely the, the sum of the impurities across all nodes, plus some function of the tree size when uh, that sum no longer decreases. So when the sum of the children nodes no longer decreases. So parameter optimization is one problem. And secondly, there might be a horizon effect. horizon effect meaning that you sometimes have to make decisions or have to make splits that in themselves do not look beneficial uh, in order to later obtain a better classification. So as an example, I would like to show you the classical XOR problem. So if we uh, we will need to make one split here which affords no improvement in the impurity. So here we have two crosses and two circles. And if we now make a first split, we still have two crosses. Uh, we, we, have, we still have a 50-50 mix in each of the children. But then at the second stage, we can now uh, introduce more splits uh, and finally solve the problem. So sometimes you need, need to make an investment into the future without knowing if it's going to pay off. And well, this investment is necessary because you are following a greedy strategy. So to get around this uh, horizon effect, uh, if you can afford it, it's better to not use early stopping, but to use a pruning, where pruning means you first grow your tree until all leaves are pure. And then start cutting away some until some uh, criterion is met, uh, for instance, uh, a criterion involving the size of the tree. So uh, overall, about these classification and regression trees, what is good? Uh, these trees are very fast to build. What is also good is that if you if you don't prune too much, you will have low bias. But unfortunately, this comes with a high variance. So if you 
change the positions of your training data just a little bit, a completely different tree might result. Second problem is that monothetic decision trees, so trees that make splits based on single features at a time, they have difficulty with correlated data. If you have two classes, okay, this is class one and this is class two, and they are correlated in the feature space. If you want to separate these two with uh, monothetic decision trees, well, you can start with a split here, and then you will need a split there, and a split here, and a split there. You know, it's a, it's a tedious business. You get the idea. So you will need uh, deeply nested trees to separate these two. If, however, you admit trees with oblique splits, so splits that can have any orientation, uh, then finding these splits is a bit more expensive because it's not enough to just sort your points according to one feature and then find the optimum split, but you need to, you know, try out more uh, orientations or find the best orientations, but then you can recursively partition uh, your, your feature space in a more flexible manner. Okay, we'll do anything you like in here. And trees with oblique splits have not been uh, investigated uh, in as much detail as the one with monothetic splits. Uh, also, some people mention as an advantage that uh, these trees are interpretable, uh, but I would put this in parentheses uh, because that really holds if you have very shallow trees only. So if, uh, if your tree involves uh, 10 questions, then yes, you can still try and understand what, what these 10 questions mean. But if your tree has 500 splits, you don't really want to go through the motions and understand exactly what it does. Okay, so trees are nice, but they have uh, this problem here, the high variance, and we're now going to look at random forests as a remedy for this high variance problem. Any questions so far? So random forests were produced by Bryman in 2001, a statistician from California who uh, unfortunately died relatively soon afterwards. And so I've not had the chance to meet him in person, but uh, he sounds like an original and also like a relaxed uh, person. So if, if you read his papers, 
uh, you know, he has comments like, yeah, certainly this has, somebody has proved this, but I cannot find it. And, you know, so he goes on and proves it himself. And uh, also there are some lectures by him on, uh, I think, videolectures.net, uh, where you can hear him give talks. Uh, also his papers, especially the final papers, they're really, you know, not finished all the way. So they're, you know, somehow typewritten and they still look like a first draft. But I think he, um, it seems like he had a very creative spirit. So he uh, thought out of the box and uh, uh, I think they're enjoyable also. Uh, sometimes getting a little technical, we will look at a part of, uh, you know, a tiny part of the more technical things uh, in a few minutes. Now, Random forests, I first heard about these at a, uh, at a workshop in the summer of 2001. And uh, there was somebody from industry who said, and it, it was, this paper was published in 2001, there was somebody from industry who said they just work miraculously somehow. And uh, so we actually tried them on our data and uh, sure enough they did. And uh, they have since become very, very popular. And uh, I think the main reason for their popularity is that they have, uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a procedure which, which has been proposed in a specific way. And certainly you could make other design decisions. But as it stands, it has two parameters that you can directly adjust. And uh, uh, one of them you should, you know, always set as large as your computers allow. And the second parameter, it turns out that the performance does not depend critically on the exact value of the second parameter. In other words, they're very friendly to parameterize compared to support vector machines where the precise setting of the parameters really does make a big difference. And uh, so they're used very widely today. The idea is to grow an ensemble or a collection, but it's typically called ensemble or sometimes committee in this field, so that's a technical term. The idea is to grow an ensemble of trees and take a majority vote. Uh, in effect, since you take an ensemble of trees, it can also give you a posterior probability. Uh, so beyond just getting a hard zero one decision, you can uh, ask out of 100 trees, how many voted for this class and how many voted for that class? It's not proven uh, that this number effectively converges to the true posterior, uh, but it is sometimes uh, useful. And now random forest they uh, combine ideas that were around previously, namely bagging, bagging is an abbreviation for bootstrap aggregation, So bootstrap is what Münchhausen used to pull himself uh, out of the ditch. So this is really the origin of this term here. And random, so that was proposed by Bryben himself in 96, and random split selection proposed by Dieterich in 98. And it turns out that uh, really both sources of randomness are important uh, to guarantee the performance uh, that random forests deliver. So they work as follows. You uh, you draw your samples with replacement.
So if you have n samples, you draw from your training set n times, and this will give you a new training set, a bootstrap training set, which you will put into the first tree. And then you draw samples again with replacement, and this is the training sample will go <laughs> into the second tree, and so on. And then uh, typical numbers of trees are 100 or 256, 100 because it's more than 10, and less than infinity and 256 because it will fit into a byte. So if you need to store very many results, then you want to do so efficiently. Um, secondly, so you build a total of n tree trees. Uh, don't blame me, you know, this is the way Bryman called it, uh, the number of tree trees. This is the first parameter. And then secondly, in each tree, at each node, you draw only a subset of all features again don't blame me and we've had you know reviewers of our papers complain if we used other when we used other terms so um, you draw only m try features to optimize your split over So rather than take all p features, you only take a random subset of m tri features, and you only find the best split among those m tri features. Now, by the way, um, the fact that you don't use all the samples for each tree gives you a nice inbuilt, uh, so-called out of bag estimate. the accuracy of your entire forest. <coughs> so out of bag, I think this was also first used by Brian in this term. You know, when you draw samples, the ones that you have drawn and the ones that you've trained uh, your tree with, they're in the bag and the remaining ones are the out-of-bag samples. So you uh, you grow the trees uh, until the leaves are pure, and you then take only these samples that were not in the bag, so the ones that were not used in the training of a particular tree, to also pass them down the tree and see how good you did on, the, on those. So it is something similar to cross-validation. Is that clear? Okay, I don't need to write it down. Then uh, secondly, uh, something that random forests afford you is a variable importance. Ryman himself uh, proposed two variants. Um, for instance, uh, one variant that he uses is to add up the Gini decrease that you get from a variable averaged over all trees in the forest. And by the way, there are more proposals in literature, but I'm just giving Bryman's here. So You 
add up the Gini decrease afforded by a given feature, over all the nodes and all the trees. There's an alternative definition which is a bit more costly where you scramble the values of a given feature and then uh, compare the, uh, and then measure the decrease in prediction accuracy. And this is more expensive because for each individual feature, you generate a new trading set in which one particular feature has been scrambled and then train a whole forest on this and see how good its uh, out of bag error estimate is. Uh, it, by the way, also gives you uh, proximities Again, there have been later proposals in the literature, but the one made by Brian and himself was uh, to count how often two observations end up in the same leaf. So each time that two observations end up in the same leaf, you increment the similarity between these observations by one. And then these similarities can be used for visualization in a procedure called multidimensional scaling that we will discuss two weeks from now. But it can also be used to find outliers points that are far away from your class. So I want to show a few of these things in pictures. These slides are courtesy of Björn Menze and this is first how you construct a single decision tree. Okay, so you iteratively split feature space until the two classes are well separated. And you can now do that repeatedly on bootstrap samples. So you see that uh, each of these points have been drawn, each of these sets of points have been drawn with replacement from the training data and you build a tree on each of these bootstrap samples and then average your decisions. And so for instance here for these two overlapping classes, so the black lines would be the decisions or the splits made by the single trees and the purple line will give you the average across uh, all these trees. Um, this is uh, from an empirical study uh, where uh, the task was to uh, find BSE in blood serum samples. Uh, so uh, if you remember those days, you know, when mad cow disease was an issue, uh, several f companies, uh, Roche from Mannheim amongst these, uh, tried to find uh, ways of, uh, well, making or detecting for sure if, uh, if, if uh, an animal had this disease or not. And so they gave us uh, a training set, but not the test set. So uh, it was really black box from our side. Uh, we had to deliver the method and they would test how good it was. And 
and those were the methods uh, that they had uh, tried on the data previously or that they had tried with the university partners. And uh, so the meta classifier is, uh, uh, <coughs> took something like an average decision of, of these things. And uh, you can here see that uh, you know, just the random forest alone did as well as the combination of these other methods on that type of data. And uh, so here you see across, uh, so each position here is one spectral channel because the data was uh, infrared data from the blood serum. And you can here see which features were selected for each of the classifiers. Um, this here, I think the features were selected using some genetic algorithm. Um, I don't know the, det the details of those. You also see the features selected by random forest. And uh, what's interesting is that random forest picks other features than uh, you would if you only considered a single feature at a time. So um, what you see here in uh, black and in gray is um, these are spectral channels from left to right. And the bold lines show you the median spectrum of the one class and in gray um, the median spectrum of the other class after some prior rescaling and so on. Uh, and then these other lines, they uh, tell you something about the quantiles. So essentially, these curves summarize the distribution of the one class and of the other class. And you see there are some areas where the two classes uh, are clearly separated. And if you now use a uh, univariate feature importance measure, uh, like uh, you, know, you, you could do a t-test, for instance, at each individual feature and ask if it is informative or not. So if you use such a univariate measure, this is shown by the gray line down here, you get high values for those features that separate for those individual features that separate the class as well. Uh, but interestingly, if you now use a multivariate feature importance, in this case from the random forest, it also assigns high importance to those spectral areas where you have a lot of class overlap. And well, the reason is that perhaps um, you know, this spectral channel alone is not informative, but it could be that if this spectral channel goes up and this one goes down, that that does give you an indication whether uh, it belongs to the healthy or, or the sick class. And uh, well, random forest allows you to capture such uh, variable importances that go beyond just a single variable. And then you, you can also go on and uh, build linear models on only the selected variables, for instance. And uh, so this was a bigger study where uh, here linear methods were used on only those features that had been uh, selected by random forest. And well, the result was that uh, it helps to use, uh, you know, underline means good result. And here you see a multivariate feature selector was used uh, to select those features on which afterwards a linear or nonlinear method uh, was trained. And well, there are many more pictures, I guess. Okay. So, it is a good method. Uh, I see that I have no time left for the theory of this today. Uh, actually, random forests are not fully understood. So, nobody really understands why they're doing so well. And uh, their convergence has not even been proven yet. However, if I had had enough time, I would have shown you uh, Breiman's arguments um, of why, in particular, uh, yeah, why these two sources of randomness are helpful. And essentially, the argument is that if you build such an ensemble or such a committee of classifiers, you want each individual member of the committee to be as good a classifier as possible, on the one hand. But on the other hand, you want them to make uncorrelated errors. So if everybody, you know, if, if you, uh, if everybody makes uh, the same errors, then, 
you are not going to learn anything by asking multiple uh, uh, people. So the point is that you really need different, uh, uh, you need some independence of these classifiers. And this is what these two sources of randomness uh, help assure. Okay, I don't mind about the tape. We anyway need to go on. <laughs> um, 